Good morning, everybody, to uh, the meeting of the Trust Board. This is a public meeting, and you should have all just been reminded that the proceedings are therefore being recorded um, so that the public can see it. Um, we have uh, Mike Gotch from the Council of Governors uh, joining us inside the meeting, and no doubt a number of other governors will watch um, the recording in due course. I'm aware of apologies from Paula and Joy. Um, I don't think we have any expected apologies apart from that, Neil and Nora. No, Chair, those are the only apologies I think we have. Thank you. Uh, and we have a number of agenda items for which we'll be joined by colleagues at the appropriate point. Um, so when we get to the Freedom to Speak Up item, uh, Taffy Mackay, the interim lead uh, FTSE Guardian, should be able to join us from clinic, um, or maybe not from the clinic, but release herself in the clinic to join us. And Susan Paluka, who, as Joy already realises, has done uh, lots of work supporting the um, activities over the past few months that have led into the paper that's coming to us. Um, we'll also have Claire Pulford for the item on postgraduate medical education uh, and Keith Channon in relation to R&D, um, just in case Megan can't answer all the questions, she'll uh, have support uh, from them. Um, it's because it's an annual report, Chair. I know, I know, I'm just teasing. Um, and uh, I need to check whether there are any declarations that need to be made to this meeting in relation to items on the agenda or new declarations of interest that will go on the register but wish to be picked up. Anne's gone off uh, mute to make her usual declarations, I assume. Are there any unusual ones that need to be added or not? No, just the usual ones. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, in relation to the charity, we'll be aware um, of that for Anne. That takes me on then, I think, to the minutes from our September uh, meeting. Um, I've not been warned of any corrections that are required, but that doesn't mean there aren't any. Can I check whether or not um, uh, anyone has corrections that we need to make to those minutes. It doesn't look uh, as though there are, which is fantastic. Um, well done to uh, Neil and Laura uh, on that. Um, we should then pick up the action log. Um, you just bear with me while I pull it up. So we have um, a couple of items which I think we should be able to close uh, in that um, we have now got medicines reconciliation uh, in the uh, IPR um, and uh, we also have had a discussion at the October meeting on medicines reconciliation uh, thanks to Megan for introducing that. And my memory is that we thought that they could then go into business as usual as a um, reporting mechanism. Megna, you're nodding, so I think that's um, uh, the, the right answer. Um, yes, Chair, and the only other thing was for Vivian Addy as the Divisional Director for CSS to bring back the review or, or into pharmacy, uh, which is linked to the medicines reconciliation work. Thank you. So I think we can close those two items uh, on the um, action log. Um, I wonder, Jason, whether you can just talk a bit about the financial risk dashboard, which was uh, 003. Yes, Chair, I picked up the action last time, but obviously in the meeting we didn't discuss timings, I think. And I've got this down as one of the FGR actions um, with a Q4 timetable. I might, and I was saying this overnight to um, Sarah in correspondence, be able to bring this one forward to add to the December IAC version of the IPR though. But all told, in, in, in a way the board should expect to see a, a revised finance IPR in Q4, but I can probably pull this particular one forward to December IAC. So I think that would be helpful because that would then enable us to close the item when we've received that. So we would expect to note when we next meet that that has been um, closed. Um, Sam, your hand has gone up. Um, it's in relation to um, to to January actions, Chair. Want me to Want to take it now, now that I've, you have my attention. Thank you. Um, just zero zero one. I just wanted some clarity outside of here, Neil, on what that breakdown was. It's just slipped my mind as to what that was in relation to. Um, so outside of here, we can do that. 
I think very quickly, Sam, I think there were two things. There was one about the difference between our local services and our specialist services. And would we find out whether or not if we looked at the postcodes of women, you know, we'd be able to understand that the experiences that came from local women with low risk births as a, and not hidden inside the others. And then there was also an issue about BAME women and whether or not there were uh, differences of experience um, that they had. So I think those were the key things. Thank you. Um, and as you say, they don't fall to come until um, January. Um, and um, then I think we have 004, which was the pre-COVID benchmarking um, so that we had a clearer understanding of where we were in relation to pre-pandemic, because if we only go back 12, year, 12 months, we won't have a sense of what it was like. Um, Eileen, I think this fell to you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Mark Curry is progressing that action, and that should appear in our reports moving forward after this date. So um, we probably can't close that till we see it, but we would expect to close it, would we, at the the next meeting? That's a nod. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's all the action log. Have I missed anything? Neil, shake your head if I haven't missed anything. No, thank you. Um, in relation to chair's business, there are just a couple of things to, to put on the, the record. Um, uh, we should note that Javed Khan has now been announced as the chair designate of the integrated care system. Um, Javed has been chief executive of Bernardo's, which uh, is one of the, the largest children's charities in the UK and has done various things in the health and social care sector um, previously. Um, we've made contact with him uh, and hope to invite him into Oxford and to meet people in due course. Um, as far as I'm aware, we've not seen an announcement yet of the chief executive from the ICS. Um, we understand they're all to be announced uh, at the same time nationally. Uh, and Bruno, unless something's happened in the last couple of days, um, I don't think we have any announcements yet, do we? No announcement. Okay, thank you. Um, I should also uh, note that the Oxfordshire leadership community is continuing to collaborate in the way that it did during COVID and thinking about operating as a, as, as a system. Uh, and I've no doubt that as the ICS beds down, that will become increasingly uh, important to us. Uh, we should note that the Council of Governors has already had a chance in seminar to have a first think about the sorts of issues that em emerge from the proposed NHS legislation uh, and the new ICS structure. Uh, and obviously, as a board, we'll have a chance to be thinking about that as well. So it's clearly going to be a major part of our business uh, over the next few months. And finally, I just need to note, I think that we had originally expected assurance and risk strategies to come to this meeting after an annual review, but that review, as I understand it, has indicated that nothing needs to change at this point, and they're still within their, their three-year validity. So although we do an annual review, we've approved them until 2023. So Eileen, I don't think we need to discuss any of that, but I just need to check that I've understood that pattern correctly. She's nodding. So uh, we'll note for the record that the annual review did take place um, uh, and that we don't need to bring uh, a paper. Eileen, you came off mute. Did you want to add something to that? No, Chair, that's correct. It's it's just to check the food that they remain valid is the purpose of the annual review. And that's been complete. Thank you very much. Um, then I think I hand over to Bruno now for the Chief Executive's report. Bruno. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I'll just give a, an update that sort of sets the scene for the rest of the, the public board uh, meeting. Uh, it's no surprise that we've been dealing with a significant fourth wave of COVID infections in the community, which has led to an increase in uh, admissions and unfortunately also number of patients that have died with COVID in our hospitals. Um, there are signs that the peak of the fourth wave are behind us now, which is uh, good news. But of course, um, this will be relieving some pressure, uh, but we still have significant uh, COVID pressures on our services. And uh, no doubt there will be a fifth wave uh, building uh, in the future. So uh, we are preparing for a continued 
COVID uh, service in our hospitals, um, which of course has significant impact in terms of um, the pressures on our on our staff. Um, in contrast to the previous waves, we have a relentless attendance at uh, A and E in both of our A and E sites. Uh, very large numbers, um, and it's also more difficult to get patients back home than during the, the previous waves uh, because there's uh, less support available uh, also in inpatients homes because people are back to, uh, back to work. Um, so there's a, a very high pressure um, in the emergency uh, services. Uh, I must say that the clinical teams are doing an amazing job at increasing productivity in outpatients, in diagnostics, in the operating theatres, so that we can uh, diagnose and treat as many patients as possible with uh, the limited capacity uh, we have uh, available. And we'll come back uh, to some of that. So not a surprise, a lot of the, um, the, the report that we submitted for the public board in terms of my update was focused on staff well-being. Uh, it is uh, can be understated how difficult uh, the pandemic uh, uh, has been and still is for our staff in terms of pressures um, that really feel relentless. And so we are focusing a lot on supporting them. Uh, also making sure that they can speak up. Uh, we'll talk about the freedom to speak up initiatives. Um, we're um, working along staff to make sure they're all vaccinated for flu and against COVID. Um, and we'll have some more updates on that as well. And then uh, there's a lot of focus, as you were saying earlier, Jonathan, on uh, collaborating with other providers. Uh, in Oxfordshire, you mentioned uh, specifically Oxfordshire with uh, GPs, community services, uh, social care, to be able to um, uh, sort of work together as a, a system to deal with the uh, urgent care pressures. But we're also collaborating with other uh, NHS trusts in the BOP uh, ICS on some of the uh, routine elective diagnostics and uh, treatments. And there is a very strong collaboration across Thames Valley with uh, trusts that actually cover uh, several ICSs and regions in NHS England for the more specialised uh, services. Um, and I think those collaborations have really been uh, deepened during the pandemic and we're sort of building on those strong personal and institutional relationships to make sure that we can manage these uh, relentless uh, pressures that uh, that we're dealing with. So the report gives a lot of great examples of things we've done to support staff, but also great examples of um, celebrations of the contributions that staff uh, have made. And I'm not going to read them all out because it's an extensive report, but more than happy to uh, answer any questions uh, on that. Thank you, Bruno. One of the things you mentioned was the Chelsea Garden, so I thought I'd go to the Chelsea Garden while we were. I was uh, surprised with your magical uh, appearance in uh, in Chelsea. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it was a fantastic thing to see, and you know, much appreciated by char staff as a recognition of uh, what's been a really difficult time. Katie, thank you, Chair. Um, Whilst it's not in your excellent report, Bruno, I just wondered whether you've got any early indication about reaction to the news about um, mandatory vaccinations? Um, there, without doubt, there's no single reaction to it. It's very mixed um, and it doesn't come as a surprise because we've been consulted on the, uh, the possible uh, decision. And so we're um, dealing with the decision of the government in a way that um, uh, we need to make sure that we work with the unions and with our staff members uh, to see how we implement uh, that decision. And it needs to be seen as a supporting staff to be safe and also keep our patients uh, safe and try to better understand uh, staff members that are not yet vaccinated, why that is and how we can uh, potentially convince them on a voluntary basis to be uh, to be vaccinated. 
but of course there will be discussions um, um, closer to the February uh, deadline for the first dose on uh, what happens if uh, frontline staff members still decide not to to be vaccinated which would have to be redeployments and um, and uh, to other areas that are not uh, frontline so it's going to be um, I mean the reactions are going to be very individual is my short answer Katie um, and we're going to have to deal with each individ individual member of staff in a very unique uh, in a very unique way thank you Thanks, Bruno. Tony. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, just to follow up on that, I was wondering if we have an understanding of the proportion of our staff that have been doubly vaccinated and the distribution of those within the different areas of service. Um, and I appreciate that those who wish to remain unvaccinated might have to be redeployed uh, in non frontline activities. But that will make it difficult because they will naturally um, congregate with and associate with other members of staff. Um, so I just was wondering uh, two things, therefore. Do we have those numbers uh, and do we have a sort of contingency plan about what to do with that for those who will not be vaccinated? And thanks, Terry. Terry. Uh, it looks Terry, so Terry might want to ask. Working on it, and I see Terry voluntary raised his hand so i'm gonna hand it over to terry yeah so um we're currently validating the numbers to make sure that the data is correct um there are a number of ig issues that we'll need to work through um a project group is being set up to deal with um exactly where the issues are how we'll look to resolve them and as bruno said you know how we can look to ensure that all of our people do take vaccinations and if if they don't um how we manage them through that so it's really early days at the at, at the moment where we're putting a project plan in place we're validating the information that we that we have and then we're then we're gonna move forward with it and, and we can bring back an update to the board on where we are with that thanks tony terry i think that would be useful i have gavin and then tony I was going to follow up in many ways on Tony's comment. I mean, do we have any granularity on apart from a date and a mandate um, which has been announced on how this is going to work? Because the, the idea of redeployment, that, that's not what is in the narrative that we are fed. So whether or not redeployment is going to be an option, I, I would question. I don't think we should speculate too much on Secretary of State's um, future thinking along the back of it. Terry, can you answer that particular bit before I go back to Tony? Um, um, so in in terms of the, the exact detail about um, the dates, we know people will need to be double vaccinated by the 1st of April. That will normally mean <sighs> that around by, Feb by February they'll, they'll, they should have had their, their, first, their first jab. In relation to redeployment, if if then if they're not allowed to work because uh, they're not vaccinated, then the first option for us will will, will need to be redeployment. Otherwise, um, um, potentially, uh, um, it, it, it it would mean that they can't work. So there are a number of employment law implications in it. Uh, um, there's going to be some further coming that um, um, guidance coming out around from the Department of Health and, and, and Social Security about moving forward. And, and as I said, we've got a project group set up to deal with it, but it's it's not straightforward in my view. Thanks, Terry. Tony. Thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, I, I, I just want to follow up. I can see that Gavin and I are thinking along the same lines and, and that this is potentially a huge problem for us. Um, and I'm slightly nervous about the timelines um so I, I do think we need to get a, a a clear understanding of the proportion of our work staff that are not vaccinated because if indeed a significant proportion of them choose not to ha have the vaccination then and one must hypothesize that that will likely be the case um because they've avoided vaccination to now we are going to face major workplace problems and, and I think we really need to know where these people are um, quite quickly um, because we're going to face the first problem 
uh, well, in the next few weeks, because they're, they're going to refuse their first vaccination before the 1st of February. Um, so it would be helpful to have a clear understanding of when we will get those figures. So, Terry, I think given the timelines, it would be quite helpful for you to keep board members briefed uh, in between meetings on uh, where we think those staff are working and th th a little brief on what the project group comes up in terms of the timelines. Um, formally, this can come back as um, uh, to our next board meeting, but I think we shouldn't wait for the board meeting on this. We need an understanding of how big an issue it is and where it's focused um, pretty quickly. Um, so Ted, if we could ask you to keep us briefed as the clarity emerges uh, rather than waiting for the, the business cycle of meetings. I think that would be helpful. Claire. Um, just to add to that, and I absolutely agree with everything that's been said, but it would be helpful to for us to know, I think, just at top level, sort of how we are engaging with people who have thus far chosen not to be vaccinated, because I think it's still a dialogue and a persuasive discussion. Um, so that would be great. Thanks. And we made significant inroads into people who weren't sure first time round by communicating clearly, giving staff the chance to ask questions of um, Andy Pollard in order to get the right frame on this, you know, which is you know, we have a responsibility to care for our patients and we should be taking steps to stop our patients being put at risk and stop our colleagues being put at risk. No, and that that's the main focus of this. The, the, the government's interest in mandatory vaccination is all about increasing the rates in order to keep people safe. You know, and I'd rather we started with that discussion about keeping people safe than uh, started with a discussion about the, the possible sanctions and, and redeployments, because that's got to be our, our first step. But as everyone's pointed out, the timeline is pretty tight, so we need to understand if that doesn't deliver um, what else we need to do. So Terry, you'll take that on. Well, you 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 already have it in hand. You what you'll take on from this discussion is keeping the board regularly briefed on uh, the timelines and and what's emerging. Thank you. Um, I'm sure we shall return to that um, uh, issue, but it will need to be necessarily before we have another formal meeting um, of the board. Are there any other questions or comments for Bruno on the Chief Executive's report? Thank you very much. In which case, then we should move on to uh, the patient perspective. Um, and I'll hand over to you, Sam. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so, a couple of points that I want to raise um, for discussion from this story. So, the story predominantly focuses around um, transitioning from children's to adult services, which you'll see from the story is multifactorial, complex in nature. Um, and there are a number of elements to, for us to consider to ensure that we've got a, a sort of seamless, systematic approach to this across the organisation. There's key national drivers um, for this work as well. I think what I need to say is there are already some absolutely excellent examples. Uh, Renal is one example. When we started this work, there were a number of very embedded, excellent examples for us to learn from. Um, and we've made it a trust priority, quality priority, um, to focus on this work over the course of the year um, under a quality improvement pathway. Um, and this is really critical because we need to give a level of trust and confidence to our families. And that came through for me in the report um, because it's a significant transition, not only from a long term care perspective, but from child to adulthood and, and how that feels for the families that have been very involved in um, that individual's care. Um, so really, I just wanted to share that story, share the progress of the update, um, give some assurances around the, the very strong cross division that's set up, um, the strong engagement. I think that the teams wanted to reflect back that they're getting from um, individual services. And in terms of next steps, um, there's a number of charities that offer support for funding um, for lead roles. So we're pursuing a number of those applications. Um, we're working on the Ready Steady Go tool, which came through as, as needing refining now that that's been um, used in practice over the last year or so. Um, and there's a quality summit, whether that's the right word or not, I'm not sure, but there's a, um, a coming together of, of the right individuals and, and really some learning from uh, across the patch um, 
and from colleagues that are nationally leading on this position. So really to summarise, it's really to give assurance that there is considerable commitment to having a higher profile for this work across the Trust so that we can better support children and their families. And it's anticipated that the outcome of the surveys and the quality summit will give us the right information for us to better be informed and facilitate um, the development of the pathways so that we've got an overall cohesive trust approach to, to these services. Thank you, Sam. <coughs> Are there any comments or questions from Sam? Katie's first off. Thanks, Sam. So very quickly, do we have a sense of how many um children are currently in the system that we know are going to move into the adult system so do we know what the pipeline is no that that's the more granular work i think that that's the sort of diagnostic that's being done at the moment um and then that will inform us of the resources we need and the improvements that we need to make um so that's something that's being scoped at the moment all right thank you Sam, can I ask a, for a bit more about the sort of governance processes moving forward? I was struck by the, the very interesting and very constructive observations from the IPI group from that, but I couldn't quite see how we could be assured as a board that that voice stays influential uh, in the process. And I can also see that this is an area where it won't be enough to do things inside the trust and we'll need to be collaborating with um, uh, social services and possibly primary care. Um, so so what's the process for sort of holding those things together so that we don't sort smooth down one of the transition barriers within the trust, but just make things more difficult in, in some of the others? Because ev everybody you talk to about this transition, you know, it's all about falling through the gaps, isn't it? And it's the gaps we're trying to plug. So I just wondered how we were going to make sure that everybody was working on this consistently together. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I agree. And I think, again, that's a sort of live debate at the moment. Um, so traditionally, there's either been, as I said, a real variance in practice where there's excellent um, and a service can assure um, very readily um, how they manage transition from children's services to adults. Um, and then there's, you know, there's a paucity of information in some other services. To some extent, some of this is sat within the safeguarding team, which I don't personally think is the right um, team for it to sit with. I think it needs to sit with the clinical services. Um, and I think, you know, as I say, some of the surveys and the work that's being done and a cross divisional group that looks at what does good look like and how we can be assured and what are the monitoring processes so that we can reroute that into business as usual rather than seeing it as a sort of separate safeguarding because it involves young people. This should be a normal passage um, through a, a clinical pathway. So I think to, to see it as more of a QI project and a quality priority, um, use that methodology um, and develop some, some tools and tips and good learning both internally and um, nationally. We can develop some method of assuring patient experience and family experience um, through normal divisional governance processes. I mean, to be defined, but what I don't think at the moment is it sits in the safeguarding portfolio because it's not a safeguarding issue. Um, sometimes it is, um, but but it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be generically. Um, uh, that makes a lot of sense of why it shouldn't sit in safeguarding. It doesn't quite answer the question of how the business as usual structures would include giving Yippee a voice and would include the external partners we need to work with. So I think it would be useful. I about, uh, yeah, I think it is about the ownership. So um, it's interesting that, you know, children serve that the ask is really that adult services lead in greater partnership rather than um, children's services. So it, we've got to reform the patient experience from adult services and the engagement groups in adult services with Yippee rather than them kind of being a lone voice. So that's really what's coming through. Absolutely. So I, I would be interested to hear a bit more about what the structures look like <coughs> that deliver this a bit later on in the process. That would be great. Uh, Sarah Randall. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think this is a great paper and insight, and I think it's something that um, has been a real need over a number of years. This transition from our children to adult services is absolutely critical. 
I think I'm really support of this about a cross divisional adult services approach because even though you've been transitioned into perhaps adult rheumatology if you like that child may also go to surgery so it is uh, and they've been in hospital as a as a, as an early stage so I think it's where you perhaps don't, although they know about children's services, but they go into another adult as, as well as their perhaps designated specialty. So I think it's that for me is really important. And I too, I think chair would be really keen to know how this gets been really embedded both across the organisation, but much wider across our, our local systems, but happy to help and be involved in that. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. And there's a, a there's a big overlap with problems of transition in CAMS into adult mental health services and no doubt some of our young people are users of both of our services and and those services so I think Sam you've got a you know we very much welcome to focus on on this story you've got a lot of support for that approach to it but a desire to understand a bit better what the organizational response needs to look like if, if you take that forward Sam um, I'm just virtually looking at Megana to think through the timescales for our next quality um, priority reporting. Um, are you content that that's sufficient um, that we, with that, those questions in mind, when we do our next um, return for quality priority, we ensure that there's uh, relevant assurance around, as you say, the more business as usual governance ongoing, how we assure that this will route into business as usual? Megana? Yeah, I mean, I think I think there are two things. I think the question is, you know, if we can't tackle the whole thing, do we? Because there's a proposal to extend the priority to next year. So the question is, you know, what are the are there any quick deliverables between now and the next year? And and if there are, we should focus on them. I'm sure the improvement team will help uh, deliver those along with the clinical uh, uh, teams. But also then if we're going to extend it, we need to probably be more focused so that so that we are absolutely aware of what three things we're going to um, uh, achieve in next year if we continue this quality priority. At the moment, there's a hold in our diaries for a quality priority planning day that we used to have, as you know. Uh, which we did virtually last year, so hopefully we'll do it in person this uh, coming year, and um, that's in January. Thanks, Megan and Sam. So, I mean, it seems to me there are two slightly different things we want from this. There's the priority for the young people who are going through this um, transition into adult processes, and there's the learning for good governance Across divisions, across agencies, involving feedback from um, patients uh, and parents and, and others. That second one, I think, you know, it's really important to get that right, and we can take a bit of time on that. We don't want to stall on what is going on by waiting for priority. And I think, Megna, what you've said is that we should think about it as a, a sort of refreshing in January so that we wouldn't be rolling on this quality priority. What we would be doing is saying we would anticipate there being a new quality priority that follows on from this piece of work as opposed to it just being rolled through. Otherwise, we'll lose the momentum. I see nods from that proposition, so thank you. Anything else on the back of that um, important and interesting patient perspective? Sam, will you thank everybody involved in that um, for feeding into it? That's been very helpful. And that takes us to the uh, IPR. Um, lots of information as usual in the IPR. And um, as become our habit, I will start by throwing it open and seeing whether or not people um, have particular questions that they, they want to pick up. And if uh, executive colleagues have particular things they want to draw attention to, they can also take um, this on this opportunity. Uh, Claire is first off. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, well done on sepsis. That's great. Um, I was just a bit concerned about the increasing number of complaints that we saw in September, particularly around, I guess, a pretty overstretched emergency department. Um, I wondered if um, anyone would just like to sort of comment on that. And I was pleased to see that you were doing a review and just wondered if the sort of headlines could come back to perhaps the IAC. 
Sam, are you picking up an answer to that question? Yeah, I think uh, when I read this, I, I don't think it triangulates as well as could do with the CQC um, ED patient survey, um, which was very, very positive. Um, so I'd like to bring something back um, to IAC, if possible, um, to just table around some of the initiatives that the emergency department are undertaking um, and just bring back more of a broader picture. But the, certainly the CQC emergency department survey was very positive uh, with a number of areas where we were in the top 20% in the country for some areas that you'd be very proud of um, around care. So can I bring something back a bit broader? Yeah, it'd be good to, to get a balanced view, Sam. Thank you. Thanks. So that'll come to IAC, um, give us a bit of context and help us understand whether these indicators reflect consistently or, or whether actually we need to understand a bit what's behind them. Uh, Anne. OK, thank you. Um, there was one item that I, I picked up um, that I'd just like to ask about in the re reports for the RIDOR, um, and that relates to a fall um, in OCE at the NOC. And I just wanted to ask a little bit more about that because we have had issues um, in this area in the past with um, patients who, for whatever reason, were not able to, well, not we do know the reason, we were not able to um, make sure that they were being appropriately observed at, 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 at all times. And obviously we put in corrective action to address that in the past. And I'd just like to understand a bit more about this one and, and what we're actually doing um, to avoid this in the future. So it's on page 42 of the IPR. No one wants to pick that up. Well, if Sam. I can chair, if I could. Okay. Okay. So Megana first and then Sam. Megana talks and Sam put her hand up. I'm not sure what the right etiquette to responding to that is, but Megana, you go first. Sorry. Sorry, um, I just I just wanted to say that this I, I don't know the exact detail of this, but if it's saying um, it's saying a my major injury, so it's most likely um, uh, to be a long bone fracture. Um, and as you know, that that this used to be previously classified as uh, no harm, but but clearly if a patient in our care um, has a long bone injury as a result of all the harm experienced by that patient is what needs to be used to that's what determines the degree of harm in this case um i i don't uh, know the exact detail of the Ridor report unfortunately i don't know if sam you were going to talk about that sam thank you chair thank you, just chair. Um, I guess just another another reflection because these have been relatively recently added in as a slide into the IPR. Um, we picked up last time around a RIDOR incident and the board requested further information. So um, with your permission, I think as an exec, we need to take away both the escalation process for RIDORs um, and, as I say again, the triangulation between the incident reports that Megan and I will be expecting to review in relation to these and work through you know, the right level of information without identifying the patient. So it might be that some of this comes to private board under some of the health and safety updates. But if we can take away and come back with some suggestions about how the board are informed about riddle reportable incidences, but have the right um, granular information to be assured that we've, we've learnt um, and that things are in place to prevent future incidences. So can we bring that to the next IAC, do you think, Sam? And are you happy that that is a process by which we will get to assurance? Um, yes, I'm happy to go along with that process and see where we get to on that. So, yes, I'm happy to go with that approach. So we'll take that next at the, the IAC and uh, if necessary, IAC can flag it back to this board. And was there anything else you wanted to pick up? Your hand's still up. Oh, right. No, that, that was the point I wanted to raise. Thank you. Sam, was your hand up because you were responding to that? Uh, so Tony and then it'll be Sarah Horton. Thanks, Jonathan. So I was very pleased to see the 91% uh, for antibiotics uh, delivered with the one eye. And I think that's 
especially good given um, the pressures on the emergency department at present. So uh, well done to the team. And the only thing I wanted to mention, uh, Jonathan, was that there is a piece of ongoing work about um, long term indicators and the interventions that are being put in place to manage those. Um, and it's probably useful rather than picking out any of those right now, just to say that we're looking forward to, to, to discuss that strategy in the near term. Thanks, Tony. So that can come back to us in due course, doesn't need to be picked up now. Um, Sarah, Sarah Horden. Yes. Thank you, Jonathan. Sorry, just dealing with my mute button. Um, there are just I know that we're going to talk about the finance um, H2 in the private board, but there were just a couple of bits I wanted to pick out of this report in order to just make sure we, we've got a clear understanding where we stand today. Um, so one of them is there is a mention that the COVID funding has been spent elsewhere. And if this funding was withdrawn, there would be a, a further increase in the deficit. I think it'd be quite interesting to understand how much risk there is of that COVID funding being withdrawn and whether um, the region are aware of where it has been redeployed. Um, and also the second one, again, just thinking about what it means going forwards, there's a comment that the staff costs are two million up in the in the month due to um, junior doctor cost pressures from their rota. And again, I wondered if that's something that is a one off in the month or whether that's something we need to be aware of as we move into HT. Jason? I wasn't sure I needed to put my hand up, Chair, to indicate that I was probably the one uh, to respond to, to, to that point, but I have put my hand you, up. You couldn't have avoided it, Jason. No, I didn't think so. <laughs> um, so on the first question, um, first of all, there's a, there is a mismatch between the categories of spend that NHS England let us report as COVID costs and a wider set of, of monies that we're spending on COVID. Um, so what we've done in um, the sort of presentation of the INE early in the report is show current COVID income versus um, the reportable COVID costs. But to give a sense, one of the biggest um, categories of spend that the reporting doesn't let us kind of uh, ex report as COVID costs um, are the costs of the um, running costs of the wards on level five, for example. So we we used capital last year to completely refit two wards on level five with almost entirely single rooms and uh, the best possible ventilation with the with the intention that that they would be the first place that we would put COVID patients. And as the numbers have um, ramped back up, those are pretty much entirely utilised for COVID patients now. And we're not capturing those those costs. So the first thing to say is just sort of for the minutes as much as, as anything else. The the number that's disclosed in the report is versus the sort of externally mandated definition of COVID spend, not everything we're spending on COVID. Um, uh, in terms of the risk, your uh, colleagues will know from the, the draft work on the second half of the year in the uh, later session, um, the COVID funding is being cut by 1.4 million in the second half of the year. Um, the, there's a little bit of policy uncertainty from government about what the expectation will be next year. Some announcements have said COVID funding will cease from the 31st of March. Other planning work that we're beginning to see out of NHS England recognises the fact that they know they're going to need to smooth this. So our work on planning for 22-23 um, is assuming that there will be a, a significant drop off that we need to manage, um, but we don't know the gradient yet. Um, and then on the second question, um, yes, this is this is um, on junior doctors' uh, costs, there's a little bit of catch up here. There's a couple of things that happen. The first is we get the new rotors um, in the summer, so you tend to get rid of catch up costs at this time of the year. But Health Education England do appear to have moved trainees around. The patterns of trainee deployment are slightly different than they used to be. Um, and so we actually have a, a double cost pressure caused by this. So, on the one hand, we have some specialties that have more trainees than they had in the past, and they therefore have an unfunded cost pressure. But slightly strangely, or perhaps it just makes sense if you think about it, there are other specialties with fewer trainees than they had in the past, but who nevertheless rely on those trainee numbers um, for care. 
and are therefore incurring extra costs effectively to backfill with non-training roles the capacity that's been withdrawn. Um, as we've been discussing this quite extensively in performance meetings because it particularly affects anaesthetics and parts of not scan. Um, in part, it's driven by the fact that some trainees are overweight in probably a non-technical term that Megan will correct me on, but some trainees essentially are overweight in their experience in certain areas caused by pandemic redeployment. So that's causing a, a post, well, no, we're not, we're not out of the woods on the pandemic, but that, that's causing a skewing of the normal pattern of deployment. So it's not a recurrent number all the year, but there's a real cost pressure here, it's sort of in, in two areas caused by this. And it's it's essentially largely outside of our control. He basically, Health Education England basically tell us where they're putting the trainees and then we pick up the financial consequences. Thank you, Jason. As um, Sarah said, we, there's quite a lot we need to get our head around in relation to that and probably we hold that for here, um, uh, but we'll get back to it uh, in more detail in both in, in private sessions and seminar as we understand it better. I'm sure that everybody shares frustration that it's quite hard to uh, plan when th the uh, ship sands are shifting so much, but that is the environment in which we're working and we need to continue to grapple with that. Um, Sam, I have your hand still. Is that a new point? Sam. Please, Chairman. Um, Neil's going to add um, this data to the reading room. I was only able to get it for the IPR, but it's in relation to the pressure ulcer trajectory um, and the progress against that. So if we can just briefly share um, in relate in comparison to um, last to the 2021 categories two to four, where we're down 18 percent towards a trajectory of reduction of 25 percent um, and zero category four. Um, so. In the same time period of 2021, we had two Category 4s. We've had no reported Category 4s um, year to date. So Neil's going to get that information embedded and into the reading room, and that will be part of the IPR going forward. Thank you very much, Sam. Um, uh, Sarah Randall. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to draw people's attention to, board members' attention to um, the uh, elective care reporting alignments. I think it's on, um, um, I haven't got a page number, um, just where we've, we've changed the reporting mechanisms for the waiting list. So it's, it's titled Elective Care Reporting Alignment and Impact Changes to Monthly Waiting List Size. So we've been requested to align our waiting list submission from a national perspective to include the patients that are not yet on the waiting list but are waiting to go on the waiting list for three different types of services the appointment slot issue or asi the referral assessment services and um, or ra or the ras they call it or the cats all these acronyms the clinical assessment service so it's where patients haven't yet been allocated onto the waiting list so um, and this is a national requirement so it's just to note to board colleagues that we think we put those now into place from the end of september and our, the waiting list total has gone up by 1227 so it's just to note that because um, that was a new thing the second point I wanted to draw the board's attention was to um, on the cancer waiting times um, report um, out of the nine standards in that table. Um, as you can see, for at the two week wait and the two week wait breast symptomatic have both gone up from July. What I particularly wanted to um, bring um, inform the board about, we've had just had the September submission in and finalised and for um, the two week wait in total, we've gone up to 87, 88.7%, but breast in, is a subset of that and has achieved at 97.9%. And breast symptomatic has also achieved at 97.73% of against a target of 93%. Because I know board colleagues have been particularly concerned about breast symptomatic and you know we've actually amalgamated into a one-stop stop approach bringing together both the clinical breast service and radiology are putting on additional slots to manage the backlog and manage the current high levels of performance so teams have done exceptionally well and I know that both teams have been um, 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 that's been recognized from a Thames Valley Cancer Alliance but I just want to I know colleagues on the board were particularly concerned about this service thank you Thank you very much, Sarah. 
Uh, Megana. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to uh, provide assurance to the board because we've had two never events, which are exactly the same, one in September and one in October, which is in a, in, in inadvertent administration of medical air uh, while the patient needed oxygen. Um, this is um, uh, very unfortunate. It's a it's an alert. Um, we had an alert about five years ago from NHS England where we were warned about this and were advised that all medical air outlets be capped off, uh, except where organisations may feel that um, for respiratory patients or areas where nebulizers might be required, they should be used and a risk assessment undertaken. Um, and that was followed. However, um, the event that happened in September, which was uh, in recovery in one of our theatres, areas meant that we undertook uh, an audit. The medical devices safety officer walked every single part of the organization to ensure that medical air outlets were capped off and airflow meters were removed. Uh, and he was due to uh, go to the ward where the event happened in October that day, but the event happened a few hours before he got there. And this ward um, was one of those wards where an exception had been made, where patients are uh, increasing, ha have demonstrated an increasing need of nebulizers. So we have now, since then, um, taken out that exception um, to any areas and as a gen general rule, it capped off all medical air uh, outlets and removed airflow meters and provided different kits for nebulizers for these wards where they need uh, increased use of nebulizers for patients. Uh, we have also um, sent safety messages and cascaded this through safety huddles. So some wards have themselves come up and said, actually, hang on a sec, you know, we were one of those exception areas, but we, we don't want we don't want this. So please cap off our medical air um, outlets. Um, we have spoken to all divisional teams and clinical directors, and uh, we are once again going to undertake a thorough walk around uh, of all clinical areas so uh, to ensure that this has uh, taken place. And then we will do monthly audits uh, through the health and safety team to uh, provide uh, regular assurance in this matter. Thank you, Megan. I was going to ask about the never events had you not volunteered it. Um, I'd also like just to confirm for the record what you told me uh, outside that the patients in those two cases are unharmed. Is that correct? So although clearly we need to worry about the event happening, um, we, we didn't cause harm to patients. That's correct. Thank you. Um, before I ask my few questions, are there any other questions on the IPR? Um, could I start with the the chaplaincy, Sam? I'm very pleased to see that you have got a temporary solution to the Friday prayers issue because that's been raised with me by um, some consultants from the Islamic community. Um, and I just wonder what the time scale was for that broader piece of work that you you describe. Uh, it's page 38, isn't it, of the uh, of the IPR? Sure. So. Um... Sarah Sewell, who's our lead chaplain, um, is leading on uh, providing a briefing for me to share with executives um, around what good looks like. Um, Jason and I have had some initial discussions as representatives with Oxford um, Hospitals Charity um, at, I guess, what I'd describe it as, as the, the sort of well-being bundle that we're keen to progress around well-being space, changing facilities, shower facilities, um, and and rest space um, and also multi-faith space. Um, there's a recognition that we'd like to improve our multi-faith space across the totality of the organisation. So I'm awaiting the output from the group that Sarah's leading in a briefing so that we can feed that in and look at potential opportunities for both space and funding. Thanks so much, Sam. Um, I'll resist the temptation for more because I'm sure you'll keep me briefed outside the, the, uh, the sessions. Um, could I ask for people to brief us a little bit on the system response to the urgent care challenges? I mean, we've got a very clear picture of the challenges that um, we're dealing with inside um, ED, although I'd like to put a marker down for uh, some training for me, and I'm sure I won't be the only ones, please, on understanding that new urgent care standards dashboard, because um, it'll take me a bit of time to understand what I'm seeing there. 
but it seems pretty apparent that all across the country the pressures on urgent care you know, are escalating and um, it doesn't sound as though we can deal with that just within our own resources and I know a lot of work's gone on that I just wondered if you could brief us a little bit Sam on on how we should think about that and how we get our sight line on getting assurance that we're playing our bit and we're making the right asks of colleagues Sam I think there's a couple of things I mean Sarah can certainly do the masterclass on the dashboard um, <laughs> that's a complexity of another level for me too um, but in terms of working in an integrated manner across um, the system we shared some of this at IAC, but I think it's important from a public board perspective to note um, the, I guess, like you say, the, the governance arrangements and the assurance that we are um, a key stakeholder and regularly playing our part as part of the wider system. So on a daily basis, um, there is a system call uh, whereby senior individuals from our organisation, Adult Social Care, the Community Trust, um, the Ambulance Service and Voluntary Sector, so we work very closely with Age UK, as you know, um, work through the position, um, the demand and capacity across the system um, and there's an escalation process and frequently Sarah and I will join that call and become involved um, with other executive colleagues from across the system. On a fortnightly basis um, I chair the system urgent care group which is a very well attended um, multi-system um, group who are delivering an urgent care improvement plan externally. Um, Sarah can talk more about our internal plan which Lisa Glynn is leading. Um, we then have a monthly A&E delivery board, which I chair on behalf of Bruno, and that feeds into the Oxfordshire Place Space Board, um, where our four system chief executives and other colleagues, um, representatives from primary care um, and other agencies um, sit. Um, the, the exception report from A&E delivery board that we discussed Tuesday before last um, really outlined the pressures around flow, predominantly out of the acute provider, um, which is having a significant impact on safety of the emergency care pathway. And there are a number of actions that we're pursuing as system colleagues um, and in response to the Ipsos Mori survey, which really did share with us, um, I guess, the sort of, you know, the the difficulties that the public are facing um, accessing healthcare, um, how 111 is working, um, and there are a number of outputs from that. One of them as a good example is the recognition that we don't have a single point of access for members of the public or colleague clinicians across the patch. Therefore, the default, default position is frequently the emergency department. So that's one example of two or three rather large programmes that we're currently scoping um, the sort of risk benefits and alternatives to. And you'll see we have a winter preparedness plan um, tabled today, much of which we discussed in IAC last time and then Jason and I have got the Augmenting Ageing Well, um, both national drivers around out of hospital care and urgent community response again to decongest the, the pressures on the emergency departments. Thanks very much. And to Sarah for the, <laughs> the more internal and operational dashboard part. Just before you speak Sarah, um, we can perhaps come back to this when we get to win prepare this plan a bit later but it doesn't feel it's just winter at the moment. I mean, it, you know, it feels like this is a transition to a new way of the public wanting to access services, and that we'll need to find a way of of getting key indicators that help us understand the context and the trajectory and and our bit in in, in the system. Sarah, and I, can I just add one thing? Sorry, Chairman, that I meant yes. to add. Um, the four system chief executives are. Um, very, very keen in terms of next steps that we have a system dashboard. So I shared last time that screenshot of a &E performance, which is the, the anchor point of which Sarah and I joined performance meetings for, but we don't yet have a system dashboard that looks at the demand and capacity across all services. Um, so that's a development that, that Bruno has been very much involved in escalating through with the ICS. Thanks, Sam. I'd be really supportive of us receiving that as part of our papers once that's agreed, because I think it just reminds us that we're part of a system and uh, make sure that we, we play our role in that. But also we hold each other across the system to account for doing what we've promised. Seems really important. Sarah. So with the new clinical standards, we've um, been shadow monitoring, obviously been 
shadow monitoring that performance so we started doing that since um, October so that we and that will develop over time we have had regional and ECIS colleagues to come in and look at our internal services and they were very complimentary of our dashboard and chair I'm happy to go perhaps more, a bit more in detail outside of, of the meeting around those standards and they're still to develop to be fair and we're obviously learning from uh, pilot sites that have, have implemented those those standards so but we're shadow reporting to, um, to uh, at the moment but it's important that we start to record and look what we're, we're doing on that internally we've set up a cross-divisional urgent and emergency care group um, uh, so it has both corporate and divisional colleagues very very much engaged about how we can support the front door and particularly our emergency departments and MRC division looking at colleagues' roles and responsibilities in that and pulling from ED and making sure that we try and decompress our emergency departments and really get that on a formal footing um, again and just and getting that really embedded. Um, one of the other big things is also looking at our OPAL triggers because um, it feels at the moment we're living in a, a, what they call OPAL 3 um, 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 and we need to be able to move from OPAL 2, OPAL 1, OPAL 2 rather than just in one OPAL and are the triggers, are we actually actioning the triggers and the key actions around that so we're really looking at that and, um, and really developing standard operating procedures uh, around that, um, making sure that's compliant. So that's, that's, that's developing and very, we've got really good engagement, but the key is about the safety of the uh, emergency department for our, both our patients and our staff. Um, and we're working on that and, and making sure that we've got wellbeing needs in there for our staff as well, because it becomes quite difficult at times. Um, and I think um, I, I, I went, and we've obviously developed it um, working with the system around our winter preparedness plan, which we can talk about in, in the next couple of agenda items. I shall leave it there, Chair, unless you've got any more questions. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, I would certainly like the masterclass on those new indicators and how to understand that dashboard. And I imagine that I won't be the only one amongst the NEDs. And it might even be that if you offer it to the NEDs, a few execs might int be interested to hear you think about it. So um, that, that let's make sure we we do a bit of training on what we're looking at then so that we can use it intelligently as it, it, it goes more live. Um, yes. Just before I move on to something I wanted to ask you about, Sarah, about the, the long waiters. Um, Bruno, is there anything that we could do as a board that would assist you in those discussions about getting the urgent care thought about assistant level? Anything you'd want from us in terms of um, positioning or, or pressure? Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. We have a board to board scheduled with Oxford Health. Um, it's coming up and should be in our uh, agendas. Um, I can say that the collaboration with Oxford Health is going very well uh, across several of our services um, and that's sort of at all levels of our organizations uh, starting at the executive level all the way down to to clinical teams um, and we're very keen on building on that collaboration and of course extend it to uh, GP practices and social care organizations um, which are now being procured in the in the private uh, sector but I, I think the the collaboration with Oxford Health could be really a, a foundation upon which to further build uh, these relationships and um, I mean what, what we could do Jonathan is make sure that in that board to board we um, have a more detailed discussion on uh, some of the ser joint services that we're now developing with Oxford Health to avoid patients uh, having to travel to A&E and also joint services with Oxford Health to allow patients to uh, stay home longer um, uh, after an admission to uh, an acute or community, community hospital. So I think it's um, uh, my advice would be to really invest in the relationships with Oxford Health also at the non-executive uh, level and then extend that to the broader system. Thanks, Peter. That's very helpful. So maybe we could aim out of that board to board to test out a, a, a framework of reporting that we might encourage both boards to receive when it comes through so that we have a common set of indicators, at least within the two NHS organisations as a platform for, for more, moving more broadly. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, 
if I could go back, Sarah, to the the, the long waits, um, I thought the granularity of what you've offered us is, is, is really helpful on, on page 71. It's beginning to give me a much better sense of how we address this 104 week um, challenge. And I'm really pleased to see that you're looking closely at the, the, the group that will be at 104 if we don't sort them out by, by the end of the year. And it's really helpful to see that um, out of that, I can now understand the impact of solving the spinal services issues, for example. And I'd just like to ask you how you see us as a board sort of monitoring this and, and getting assurance, because o over the next six months, uh, th this is going to become very pressing if we don't get a sense of it. And I know from speaking with you that, that you've got a really clear picture on that and I wondered how we got that into the the board discussion so that we can all share that and get our assurance. Sarah. Thank you, thank you Chair. So I, I'm, um, I think this is a start to try and get that granularity into the board papers. I think this, uh, just to, to be clear, that this is a snapshot at the end of September. Clearly we have more patients if I forecast to the end of March that actually goes up to 600 patients. That's if we do don't do anything. So um, what I can say, we, we can do some forecasts of, of, of looking to the end of March, um, because uh, but it's it's that's going to be quite it's quite volatile, and uh, so I can be that have that more detail if board members would like that. But knowing that the fact that would be potentially quite volatile as it changes, because as obviously patients come off, because it's the whole of the waiting list, so it's patients that are up at the outpatient level at the middle part of the pathway of diagnostics and at the end part of the pathway. So, for example, if I give you the forecast at the moment as of this week, um, if we did and uh, did nothing, um, uh, but we are doing something, we have 600 patients, for example, eight, um, 82 are still at the outpatient stage, 189 in the middle part of the pathway, and we've got 329 at the the who are dated to be received treatment surgery. So we are working with divisional colleagues and clinical colleagues that we're getting though every patient. So we're almost to start to know every patient by name. So really trying to reduce those numbers down and and also those patients over 52 weeks. So we're trying to bring that those patients those patient numbers down. So I can we can show the the real numbers over over 52 weeks. 78 weeks and and 104 weeks so perhaps in a bit more detail by by specialty if that's helpful uh, chair so for next time so i i think that would be helpful i don't anticipate we need to carry on doing this for a, no, a long time but i think it's very important that as a board we understand where the where the really big challenges are and the numbers are getting small enough that um, I think you can begin to give an indication of uh, exactly where our, our log jams um, fit. And I think we should aim to do that in between now and the end of the year. Yeah, uh, certainly. And, and I've put uh, uh, just key issues that we're facing, particularly with, uh, we've said, spinal patients that we've obviously um, we're outsourcing uh, for spinal patients at the moment because of the, some of the issues with this capacity workforce is quite volatile with staff off with either COVID or off with relatives that have COVID. So that makes it quite difficult with the number of sessions that we have. So it's really making sure that we've got every session utilising that to the maximum, but absolutely give that level of detail the next time we meet. Thanks, Sarah. That's, that's really helpful. Um, the last bit I had really was around the staffing indicators around turnover, vacancy rates, COVID absence. And Terry, it just feels as though we've got a clear trend of heating up in the in, in the workforce and just wondered whether or not we think the work we're doing on well-being will help us get a grip on that or whether you think there's a sort of gathering storm here that we, we should be worried about. Uh, thanks, Chair. I, I think the work that we're doing is mitigating um, um, where we where it could be. Um, we've we've seen um, um, that COVID sickness absence has been has been going has been going up, um, but this is month six data, and um, we should be we should be um, seeing a tailing off. And I have for the last uh, week or so been seeing a tailing off on COVID sickness absence. Um, the turnover piece, I think we knew that that was 
always going to go go up after uh, after kind of like the the big peaks because people had had been waiting and people who would have left hadn't left and would our turnover rates were significantly lower so i do think we we will still see uh a bit of an increase in in our in our turnover rates but um uh, but I but I am satisfied that the work we're doing in relation to well-being check-ins, in relation to R3P, um, in relation to kind of like um, our overall strategy around for wellness, um, it is actually helping and is actually um, having an impact. There's, there's been a, a number of uh, really good good feedback that's come back around R3P and the effect it's it's had um, it's had on teams. But I, I I do think this there's on turnover around we haven't got as high as we would as we would be and the work we're doing I do feel is mitigating. Thanks, Terry. I think that's just something as a board we just have to keep a really close eye on. Just picking up the, the anecdotal things that make the media our concerns that we had about risks of burnout and the impact of of COVID as it settles look as though they are they were things we're right to be concerned about. Um, uh, so I think we need to keep a close eye on whether there's any more that, that we can do. Um, thank you. Were there other questions around the IPR? Um, we would move on at this point. My, my agenda says we have a break, but we're a little bit ahead. We would move to freedom to speak up, but we shouldn't do that unless we have Tappy and um, Susan with us, which Eileen, I imagine will be. Oh, Tappy's, Tappy's here. Yeah. Tappy, are you with us? We are on the call, too. Yeah. Um, in which case, um, could we aim to take the Freedom Speak Up review now and then we'll break um, after that? Uh, Eileen, you happy with that? Yes, thank you, Chair. I'm sure that'd be welcomed by Tappy, as I'm sure she's keen to get back to her clinical practice as well. Um, thank you, Chair. I'm really pleased to present the outputs of this um, important project that was undertaken over the period of the summer, um, and to particularly welcome Taffy and Susan Paluka, um, Taffy in a role as lead guardian, and Susan Paluka as the project lead, who supported this project. And just to remind ourselves, this was a board commissioned project. And I think one of the things that we said right at the very outset was that the board would get wholeheartedly behind supporting this project and listening to our staff and trying to understand what they were looking for from the service that um, we have signed up to deliver as, as part of our commitment to our leadership and culture programme. Um, I'm really grateful to all board members and I think and hopefully the findings as demonstrated in this um, attached document in Appendix 1 demonstrate that the time that all the board members put into the listening events, to attending various um, engagement activities and to the focus groups were really well appreciated by staff. And I think um, from the point of view of what the board really set out to do at the very beginning was not just to understand the importance of what this means to our staff and could we improve it, but also it has really reinforced the um, importance that our staff attach to feeling, to understanding that our board members listen and that they do actually get their voice heard. So my thanks to everybody for that and particularly to Taffy and Susan who have worked tirelessly with the team and with the communications department um, and Matt Aikid and his team to ensure that we have delivered a consistent um, availability of engagement events over the summer period. That said, Chair, I'm hoping that although, and I apologise that the paper is long and it's very detailed, but it was important that we captured all of the activity in there. I don't intend to present it because I'm hoping that it is um, clear in its delivery. And instead, I would invite us as we um, go through our discussion to keep our eye on section 5.2, which really looks at the um, strategic issues for consideration in relation to moving forward. And, and particularly, I would um, uh, just request any further advice or um, comments from board members, just again, for the record and for our, our um, governor on the call. We engaged a wide range of staff, including our staff governors in this process. So they have had some input for into this process with us. But the board actually dedicated a very specific session, as board members are aware, after its Integrated Assurance Committee last month, during Speak Up months, to ensure that we gave this detail our attention. So I would leave it at that, Chair, and ask um, for any comments. Thanks so much, Eileen. I mean, 
for me, this is a really important route for hearing things. And if you don't hear things, you can't do anything um, about it. And I've already learned an enormous amount just from those listening events. Um, uh, and as you say, we've had a, a deep dive into it, which has been really helpful. Um, I have um, Sam, Claire and Anne in the list, but actually I think I'll go to Claire first, if I may, as the, the non-exec whom uh, I rely on to take a lead on this uh, and then to Sam after that. So Claire. Thank you, Jonathan. I mean, first of all, I think it's been a really good project. And uh, as Eileen said, I think those listening events and focus groups have been very successful and I've certainly enjoyed uh, hearing the outputs from those. I actually have three questions on the paper. Um, the first is that you don't actually sort of really describe how you sort of intend to resource uh, FTSE going forward. Um, and I just sort of wanted assurance really that the the plans for that are going to be sufficient to make sure that we actually meet people's expectations that we've naturally raised through this process. And I think to sort of help support um, the culture that we want to see in the trust going forward as well. Um, my second question was in terms of training for leaders, and that's not necessarily sort of um, the, the hub based training, but but our general leadership training, are we including anything on FTSU in that? Because I think that there's a general recognition that um, it is the environment that leaders create that helps people to speak up and that that's actually a set of skills and capabilities which we need to encourage people to gain. Um, and then the third is really more of a comment, I suppose, which is I think the Klein report highlighted very well the fact that people find it easier to speak up to others that that show up like themselves and you know are we thinking about diversity in the broadest sense in terms of the sort of champions and leaders that we have in FTSE going forward thanks very much claire I, i'd like to hold the resources question until we get to the end of the discussion because i think there's a whole series of things that, that come up but if i forget that claire you will remind me won't you and um uh, and I, uh, I'm sure I can steer it to, to Bruno at that stage if I've forgotten. Um, could I pick up the second question and perhaps ask Terry to comment on the connection with the culture and leadership work, because that where it would sort of naturally fit um, for me? Sure, Chair. Um, um, so um, um, in relation to all of the issues around um, leadership capabilities, um, um, you know, creating that right environment, civility and civility and respect um, those are all included in our of um, culture and leadership deep dive and in the in the management training elements of it um, so um, so that's integrated there there's also a, a kind of like a, a, a training element that's been put on um, to my learning hub which kind of like uh, it enables people to get an understanding but um, a, a lot of a lot of these issues around from the cultural piece come down to actually how we treat people, how we around allow them and give them the ability around to speak their truth, around, and that's all built into our ongoing management development development training. So we've got that which is built in, and then we've also got the specific FTSE training that's on my learning hub. I think, Jonathan, can I just come back on that? I mean, I, I think, Terry, I, I absolutely agree that, you know, all of those skills and mindsets and culture are important. But I do you think there's something for me about specifically referencing FTSE so that people make that connection? And I just wondered if we do that. So there isn't a direct kind of like, um, this is um, to speak up what there is and, and the whole plan because we've got a, a as you know we've got a whole development suite of all of the management training which we're developing because that that's not in place now is around the cross reference to all of the relevant um, items that a, a manager will need to have so not only around does it include actually the you know this is the 
the policy uh, in relation to to freedom to speak up, but also this is how you manage performance uh, and so therefore the capability policy. This is how you manage, um, um, you know, a, a disciplinary. So therefore the disciplinary. So it's, it's seen as a holistic um, training for managers that doesn't just focus specifically on one element, but on all of the things that they will need to do in order to manage effectively. So it's built in built into the whole, but there isn't a single subject on um, other than a my learning hub, a single subject on around freedoms to speak up. So just just trying to tease out some issues there, Claire. Um, I think when looking at the results from the the work we've done, it's it's clear that there are confused expectations amongst staff about where to go, and it's really important that we don't allow those to slip into um, they don't go anywhere. Um, uh, so I think that's that's really important. And it was also clear that the managers felt they weren't always sure what to do about things that that came. So I think, Terry, if what you're saying is that you are not separating out Putsu from other skills that managers need to have and that it's responsible for them to create an environment in which they can speak up, then that would fit what we're after because it would make sure that everyone comes forward and then depending on the nature of concerns they raised, they get into a system that enables things to, to happen. If if what you're saying is that um, we won't flag up, that Freedom to Speak Up is there as a sort of default back backstop, you know, that says that, and if you're not sure, Freedom to Speak Up uh, guardians and champions are there in order to make sure that we don't lose that that information. So, you know, I, I think it's really important that we don't lose anything, because we, if we lose any of this, we won't be able to transform the organisation. Yeah, so so uh, so it's definitely much around, you know, the former. Around, it's about mainstreaming this around so that managers have the, the right tools, but also it's around actually making sure that they can be signposted around, uh, uh, effectively. Around, there's, there's a number of things that will tend to go through to freedom to speak up, which actually, if it was, yeah, if it, they were given the proper advice or the proper signposting, it actually wouldn't wouldn't be there. And and, and that's where we that's where we want to get to, is a place where actually it's a complete last resort. You know, when when other things are exhausted, uh, and 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 we need to train and enable our managers to create that environment. And then and, and that's where our our, our focus is. Thanks, Claire. I'm not sure we quite got the messaging right then, because getting it crisp that that's the way we see it working, and that that supports the culture of freedom to speak up, uh, and that we support that through business as usual seems a really important message to get across. Um, and I'm not sure it's it's crisp enough yet. No, until we had that discussion. I, I I agree, and I think it would be just good to have a look at it. I absolutely agree that freedom to speak up formal sort of activity shouldn't be the first thing that happens. Managers should create that environment, but I think we need to just position it in the right way. Thanks, that's helpful discussion. Um, I think I'll hold, we we'll hold resources to the end. We've noted the diversity um, issue, I think, is a, is, is a challenge, and I'll pass to Sam, and then after Sam, it'll be Anne. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so I really enjoyed the, the board discussion that we had previously, and we talked a bit more about integrating sort of psychological safety of staff um, who are involved in investigations into this. The, the piece that I think we could do more on um, is learning um, from, call it, call it the other side, but the impact on individuals whereby freedom to speak up concern has been raised. Um, there's a there's a number of colleagues who are um, feeling, you know, pretty distressed. I think over fairly long periods of time. And as Terry says, I think we should probably look at some of those cases where we could have done something much quicker in a in a normal management process. Um, and that's the. I mean, it'd be very confidential, but that's the group of colleagues that I think we might be able to undertake some learning on because of the anonymity and the protected elements of freedom to speak up. Often um, there are colleagues who are aware that there are concerns being raised, but um, that puts quite a significant stress onto them. Um, and I think there's a bit of learning that we need to do around that area. 
Thanks, Sam. And that does come partly back to the resource question, doesn't it? Because if you need these things to be done well and quickly, we need to understand where the resource sits to enable that to happen. Um, and that might sit specifically in FTSE or it might sit in the culture and leadership or the management um, support. So uh, I think that's important. Anne. OK, so thank you very much. Um, I think this has been a really great piece of work and I really thank everyone who's been involved in it. I mean, my points sort of have been picked up already, but I mean, I think within this report that we're looking at in Section 5.1, there are a number of very clear recommendations of things that we should do. And I actually I've just reread those again and I'm absolutely supportive that we should do all of those. Um, now, you know, obviously the first one is particularly important, I think, because it's talking about raising, you know, pulling together this, how do you raise a concern, raise an issue? And obviously FTSU is one route, but there are a whole load of other issues, other routes that you can adopt. So that's absolutely critical. And I, I think my, what I'm really saying is that I think we, I think as a board, I would like to say that I support that we do all of these things. I totally get what Terry is saying about this is all about the culture of the organisation. Um, but I think this particular area and these recommendations, because we have heard of all heard all of this from staff and participated in ourselves, I think we should focus on these specific actions alongside the work that's going on uh, around cultural leadership in the organisation, which will be is a long term project. So my view is that we should um, progress those those um, recommendations. And I also the other point that I al always make as well as I'm totally with Sam about the you know, how do we support people, you know, both sides of this, you know, the people that are raising the concerns and those other people that may be affected by those raising concerns. How do we support both both lots of people, both? And how do we ensure that we actually progress in a timely matter? And so those are, are critical things that, again, I know that, Terry, you're picking up, but I think we absolutely need to re-emphasise those points because those are so important to the ability, you know, to how uh, staff feel able to raise issues if they know that they are going to be supported and that those people that have issues raised against them are also going to be supported in an appropriate way. So really, I think my points are covered already, but I just wanted to re-emphasise re those. Thanks, Anne. Terry, you, you flagged up. Are you responding to that? Yeah, just a, just a quick one. So, so I agree that, that we, need, we need to make sure that um, all of the support mechanisms are there for both for both sides. And, and, you know, we've got a number of different mechanisms in place we've put in. Um, we've got psychological medicine to support. Um, we've also um, put in a number of well-being initiatives to support people. We've also got um, occupational health and we have um, well-being leads as well. Um, so there is something, though, about um, actually the managers of those services making sure and we need to make it easy for them um, to make sure that their team have the support that they need. And, and, and sometimes I find that actually, uh, you know, sometimes it's put into that too difficult box um, and people won't address it uh, uh, in a timely manner. So so I, I completely agree. We need, and there's something about how do we ensure that our people make sure that they're looking after people and utilize all of the different well-being options that we have, because I think they are considerable. Thanks, Tara. I want to pull that back a bit to the particular focus of the paper, because I think we all recognise that context is important. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Taffy after this, Eileen, before I come to you, because Taffy's raised her hand. Now, for me, in the the list of key things in 5.1, um, the development of the case studies was really, really important, because I think I picked up from the listening events that people don't really know what happens when they racing with with FTSU and actually I know from the few that I've been involved in what a lot of effort has gone into resolving those but because necessarily elements of that are um, uh, confidential we're not very good at showing what happens uh, as a result and you know, that would go quite a long way to uh, re addressing the concern that significant number of respondents had that they didn't think that everything, everything had been sorted out they thought no 
some things have been sorted out, but not everything. And explaining what an impact FTSE has seems to me a really important part of, of raising the profile because it then makes it worthwhile people um, dealing with that. Um, Taffy, I want to go to you um, next and then I'll, I've got Eileen in the queue. Uh, thank you, Chair. It was just to pick up on a point that Claire made about diversity. So um, as part of um, October Speak Up Month, we are trying to see if we can recruit some um, more champions into the service. And so we are actively trying to reach out to the networks, the different networks within um, the staff networks, and see if we can get uh, volunteers within those subgroups to be part of the FTSE team. And we've reached out to the well-being um, and culture and leadership team as well. So hopefully we'll be able to be represented across those, those areas. Um, and just thinking about the feedback, Chair, that you mentioned. So we were really happy that during October Speak Up Month, we managed to have some volunteers from clients who had used the service and they were able to do some, some videos for us that were publicized through the social media in terms of how they found um, working with the FTSE team and, and the process. So that was helpful and that's something that we're hoping to encourage further going forward. Um, and finally, just to say, I think that the listening events have been really successful in terms of staff appreciating the opportunity to engage closely with the board members and, and feeling listened to as well. Thank you. Thanks, Taffy. And I think from our deep dive, the board members got a lot after that um, as, as well. Um, I've got Eileen you, and then I need to try and work out where this lands in terms of discussion. Eileen. Chair, sure, thank you. Taffy has covered the issues for me. We did have regard to Difference Matters, that publication, as we were going through the project, and, and that has been informing our work going forward. I would like to endorse what Sam said. Um, we did, during the survey, ask people who had had to deal with a FTSE concern that had been raised, you know, and how they managed it. We did ask for their feedback as well, and I think there are opportunities for us to improve both supporting how managers listen up and act up, and also um, in supporting those staff who are the subject of um, perhaps that concern that's been raised by somebody. So there's still plenty more for us to do in that space and, and we will look at that going forward. Thanks very much, Eileen. So what I've heard in that discussion is that there's nothing in 5.1, which were the key actions um, that anybody has disagreed with. Um, 5.2, which asks for the board's st strategic steer, um, strikes me as possibly in the wrong uh, wrong order, in, uh, in that there are two points there, one of which is around ensuring that we have appropriate capability and capacity, um, uh, and the second one is uh, an operating model for FTSE, and in a sense, until you work out what the right operating model for FTSE is, you can't really identify what is the capability and capacity that needs to be in place. Um, and, and it feels that there are still some open questions on quite where the balance sits on that. And Bruno, I know you've been discussing this at TME and I wondered what the, the next step, if you like, in moving that. So I think we have a clear strategic steer from the board that they want that work done, but how will it happen and how will it come back for the board to get assurance on it? Bruno. Uh, thanks, uh, Jonathan, and I want to take the opportunity to thank Taffy and Susan, who both joined the board for the tremendous amount of work that has been done to date under the leadership of uh, with Eileen, um, and also thank all the board members because we all uh, participated in many sessions that led to this uh, to this document. And I agree with you, Jonathan. More work still needs to be done. So we've uh, agreed that we would uh, make sure that the freedom to speak up is well embedded in the organization. Um, you mentioned culture and leadership, and that starts at the top. Um, I think we've really role modeled you know, as board members uh, the importance of uh, freedom to speak up. This is about active listening. Um, it's also about compassionate uh, dialogue with staff members. And it's also being very specific on how we can help yeah, uh, when people raise uh, concerns. And I think we've been doing that as, as board leaders. We need to make sure that um, sort of happens across the organization uh, with uh, all the ward managers, department heads, that we support them in uh, doing uh, a similar sort of active listening. 
and trying to uh, be specific in addressing some of the concerns. The concerns are, are often quite diverse in nature. We talked about that. Uh, when I've been in sessions, it's about littering on our sites or lack of parking, but it could also be about uh, some difficult relationships with uh, team members or the, the team leader. So, I mean, the, the nature of the concerns are quite diverse and we need to make sure that we uh, resource the freedom to speak up in, in line with uh, some of the resourcing that we've done around, as mentioned by Terry, occupational health, uh, the psychological medicine, um, the uh, the estates, uh, facilities uh, teams, and the signposting I think is is going to be critical for this to to be um, working well, and we need to make sure that the resources both at corporate as well as at divisional and service level are uh, embedded and integrated with some of the other services that we we talked about. So there's still more work to be done, as you say, on the operating model and then the resourcing of that. And we'll be able to give an update uh, to the board in February on uh, that operating model and give assurance that we have uh, resourced uh, the different services uh, adequately. Thanks, Bruno. So I think that that indicates when it sort of formally comes back and given that we have December and January um, which are truncated months in terms of working time I'm not sure I could push for anything quicker than that but I would like us to be able to keep in touch with it I think um, in between now and then so um, perhaps if Claire and I sort of try and keep close contact um, with it Claire does that address the, how, the the sort of pathway for the resourcing issue yeah i think it does i absolutely agree it needs to be integrated but we do also need to know how we're going to specifically resource this um and i think february is really the latest that we should come back as as jonathan was indicating so i think Bruno, perhaps you and can keep Claire and myself briefed on that and if and if we feel that it's might not be resolved by February perhaps we'll kick up a bit of a fuss and we can share that with colleagues um, uh, but I think we would want in February to be able to be really clear that we have an operating model that we can support and that we have sufficient capability and capacity uh, within that and what we particularly don't want to do is to stall the momentum that's been created by this work and stop ourselves being able to recruit champions um so um that's, that's a commitment to the board jonathan but also to taffy and susan because they've been working extremely hard and we need to support them well to get the job done and make sure it's sustainable thanks bruno you took the words out of my mouth which is a good thing because i have drilling behind me um which i think means it would be appropriate to thank taffy and susan for this and this will be the point where we'll take a 10 minute break and restart with the postgraduate medical education strategy at 10 to 11, which bizarrely is exactly what the agenda says. So well, uh, despite the shift of order we've got there. Thanks very much for joining us, Taffy, and I hope the uh, clinic is interesting and that Freedom Speak Up continues to be very stimulating. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Oh, okay.